One of the hardest parts about storytelling is establishing the world. To create the rules, set up the narrative, establish who our protagonists are, teach us who our antagonists are, create the central conflict, but most importantly, do this in a way that is refreshing and keeps us interested and entertained. The more complex the narrative is, the harder that is. So imagine having to set up a narrative that exists in two different time periods, follows dozens of different characters, most of which exist in both of these different time periods, all the while maintaining a light and comedic tone, keeping the scientific aspect at a level that people of all ages can understand and appreciate. I don't think that anyone is going to say that is easy, but not only were Robert Zemeckis and Bob Gale able to succeed in doing this, but they did it perfectly. I want to pull up the timeline of this movie because I want to shed some light on how well the story was told. We need to first explore its structure. This is a film with three very distinct and very separate acts. Each of these achieves something different. The first exists only in 1985 when we are first introduced to our world. We meet our characters and learn about time travel. The first act ends when Marty gets into the DeLorean and goes back into 1955 right as the car crashes into the barn. From here we are reintroduced to the world as Marty explores his hometown when it was 30 years younger, meets his parents when they were in high school, and does everything he can to try and get his parents together. This act ends when he returns to 1985, tries to save Doc, tie up loose ends that were created in the first act. Now this all blends together perfectly to form a movie that never really seems too slow and never loses its pacing or its tone. Each of these three acts has a very specific purpose. Act 1 is for setup, Act 2 is for revelation, and Act 3 is for resolution. Let's start off at the beginning and look at Act 1. Now the very opening title sequence provides about as much information as we need to know about the characters. Doc is an inventor, as of late he hasn't had much success, but he is working on something big, something with plutonium. Marty, on the other hand, is young, reckless, has an interest in skateboarding, playing music, and obviously looks up to Doc and is good friends with him. In addition, time is very present and this scene is going to play a big part in the rest of the movie. However, this works in two ways. First, it really lets people who have never seen the movie get introduced to these characters. But in addition, it also allows people who are re-watching it to notice things that we may not have known for the first time. We see the man hanging on the clock tower. Now, this is a very clear reference to Harold Lloyd and Safety Last, but also a reference to what we see later in the film. However, the setup continues well beyond this scene as we are later introduced to our love interest, our antagonist, his family history. You remind me of your father when he went here. He was a slacker too. The main message of the movie, which is, is change. we are told about the important events that are going to play out later in the film. Is the clock tower. We meet other real antagonists and the rest of this family. And most importantly, this all happens and flows together smoothly. After this, we meet Doc and we immediately see the DeLorean time travel. This is something that is very important in that there is never a dull moment. Every single scene in this movie adds up to something. We don't wait around to get to the moment we've been waiting for. Instead, we just get to that moment and set up for another one. Everything that we see in the first act ultimately is able to set up something that is going to happen later in the movie. Once we see the DeLorean time travel for the first time, a little over five minutes later, we're seeing it again. Only this time, Marty is going to 1955 on accident. This is one of the most important parts of the movie. He didn't want to be in the situation, but was instead forced upon it. As we already learned, his character is by all means a slacker, yet he has to pick up the responsibility that is forced onto him or else he will cease to exist. But before we look into this, I want to talk about the second act. The second act is undeniably the most important part of the movie. It's where the climax is and it's where most of the content is focused around. It's where most of the jokes are and is the most enjoyable part of it. But the reason that this act works so well is because of things that were set up earlier in Act 1. What I mean by setup is very similar to a joke, in that we get a setup and a punchline. For example, when Marty first arrives in 1955, he crash lands in the middle of the farmlands. However, at this point, we as the audience already know that this used to be farmlands. Why? Because Doc told us earlier. I remember when this was all farmland as far as the eye could see. We get the setup. Are you telling me that you built a time machine? and the punchline. Out of a DeLorean? However, in doing this, we get another setup, and that, that his car looks like a spaceship and his outfit makes him look like an astronaut. So when the family comes out to investigate, they think he's an alien. Every single moment in this movie has already been set up for us. Some of these are used for a comedic effect, like here is our setup. Like the way I met your father. And here is our punchline. That was so stupid, Grandpa hit him with the car. 
but others are used to move the story along. Small, useless interactions that happened earlier in the film seem to be throwaway lines. For example, earlier in the movie we see Jennifer and Marty about to kiss, this is our setup. And the punchline is someone stops this by rattling a jar of coins in their face and asking for donations to save the clock tower. This seems to be a one-off moment, however, later in this movie, this ends up being able to get him back to 1985. So things are set up both in the 1955 part, but also the 1985 part. However, it never feels old. It never feels like the movie is rehashing itself, but instead it provides a sense of nostalgia. And it makes sense, we are seeing a world that we have already heard about, but most younger audiences have obviously never experienced because they weren't born in 1955. Once we get to the city, we are treated to happy, upbeat music and the feeling that we are in a simpler time. And I think that this is the heart of the film. I think we get a love letter to the 1950s. The film's two writers, Zemeckis and Gale, were both born in the early 50s. And part of what this movie tried and succeeded in doing was showing off their idea of the 1950s, showing it off through a child's perspective, someone who is fresh into this world but still needs to experience it. This sense of nostalgia exists not only a way to tell the story, but also as a personal note to the 1950s. However, there's also more than that. When Marty first enters this world, it appears to be perfect. A fun time where everyone is happy and nothing bad happens. But as we soon learn, that isn't even remotely true. We see the contrast between the 50s and the 80s and see that they are both very similar. The problems that exist in 1985 are the same problems that existed in 1955. I think that this shows that no matter what technology is invented in the future, people are always going to be people. The only way around this is to make the most of your situation, not try to change it to make it better. I want to end this video by looking at the conclusion because it is very different from the first and second acts. Whereas the first act sets up the second act, the third act is used to tie everything together. Problems that were created in the first act are suddenly resolved. I think this really has to do with the pacing. Over the past hour while Marty was in 1955, he had been solving all the problems that were created in the first act. Now, we think that Marty is only going to get back to the future and that's all that he's going to be able to do. But as we soon learn, he also resolves the problems that were created in the first act, like his family's social status. Marty is fixing both his problems in his life, but also his parents. I think that above all else, Back to the Future shows the importance of a great screenplay. This movie could have easily turned out to have been another forgotten science fiction film from the 1980s. Instead, it was so much more than that. It created lovable characters, gave us a fun story, made us laugh, and all around showed off great filmmaking. This is a movie that followed the rules. Characters were developed, conflicts were introduced, locations were developed, and the audience was taken into the world in the first act. This movie took influence from other movies that have worked in the past and made something great of it. This is a fun movie that flows together and works perfectly. I am by no means the first person to bring this up. There are entire courses taught about this movie and storytelling, but I think that it's important for everyone to watch this movie to learn the fundamentals of good storytelling and good filmmaking. Thank you very much for watching, it's been a little while since I watched this movie and it was so much fun revisiting it. As I said, there's so much you can learn from this movie and I highly recommend watching it if you haven't seen it or revisit it if you haven't seen it in a little while. Next month we're going to be looking at horror movies in October. It's not going to be all traditional horror movies, but also some psychological thrillers. Next week we're going to be looking at David Fincher's Seven. That video is going to be out next Saturday, October 1st, there's a link to that video on the right of the screen. On the left is my last video, in which we looked at Richard Linklater's Waking Life. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.